What was your highest rank? Sergeant. Okay. And in what general locations did you serve? Uh, well, when I got out of boot camp, I went to Camp Lejeune for four months. Then I went on what we called a float, which was a cruise. And uh, we got offloaded in uh, Guantanamo Bay for six months. Came back in the fall, and uh, let's see, that was 67. And uh, we got our orders for what was known as West Pack, which uh, was Vietnam. Okay. Um, uh, so you were enlist. You enlisted, right? That's correct. Um, where were you living at the time? I was living at uh, Twenty Two High Ridge Road, New Britain, Connecticut, with my folks. Uh, and uh, you know, I talked it over with them. I went to a very good high school. And I had good grades. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, which is uh, no longer around, but it, uh, it was a very good school. And uh, <laughs> we knew that, you know, my parents had five kids. And I said, uh, it's obvious, you know, you can't afford uh, tuition. And uh, the draft was starting to heat up a little bit. And, uh, you know, I said to myself, well, you can either wait for the draft or you can uh, join a branch of the service that, uh, you know, you want to serve in. And, uh, beat the draft and possibly go with a unit that's better than the Army. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that disrespectfully, but I felt that uh, you get a lot more training and you'd be somewhat prepared for Vietnam versus a draftee who did basic training and got dropped in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. So you kind of wanted to control over what you did. Right, Vietnam. exactly. And, uh, you know, well, when I got to Vietnam, I already had a little bit of rank. I was a Lance Corporal and, uh, You know, that, that gave me a fire team right off the bat. Marine Corps rifle squads are composed of 12 to 13 men with a gun squad, a machine gun squad, which is from the weapons platoon, which will move around as needed. And uh, it's 13 men and Four, th four man, three three fire teams of four men each, plus a squad leader and radio man sometimes. So, uh, but that was the configuration, and uh, you know, was, well, what what were we just uh, what was I talking start to talk about? Um, well, why you joined the Marines, um, you said the, you wanted to be prepared. Yeah, you know, the training, basically, I wanted to make sure that, uh, as I said, I went with a good unit mm -hmm. and that, uh, they take care of me, I'll take care of them. So did you know that you are going to go into a, the Marines with a higher rank when you uh, enlisted? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, rank, if you earned it. You got promoted, uh, went from private, private first class, to Lance Corporal, to Corporal, to Sergeant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, if 
if you spent your time in grade, if for one grade it was a year or so, and you kept your nose clean and did your job, you got promoted. So, you know, it was a fairly simple system. Sure. Um, do you recall the date that you enlisted? Uh, mm, enlistment? No, because it was sometime in May of 66. The reason I can't remember the exact date was uh, me and my two friends went down to the recruiting uh, station and uh, filled out the paperwork and everything about a month before our graduation. At the time, the Marine Corps had a policy of letting us enlist before we got out of high school and more or less picking our uh, date to report to Paris Island and uh, we didn't leave until September 15th, 1966, which so we had the whole summer off more or less. And okay, so you enlisted in May but you didn't actually go to boot camp until September? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how were your uh, first days in service? I didn't have any problem with uh, boot camp. I mean, when I got off of that bus, it was funny because my buddies and I enlisted under what they called the buddy system. And that meant that you would go through basic training in the same training platoon. Well, when we got to Paris Island, it was about 9 o'clock at night, and this maniac, the drill instructor, of course, mm -hmm. jumps on that bus, and he is screaming at us. I could not believe it. I said, well, talk about culture shock. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we... we uh, Got on the yellow footprints, stood there, you know, shaking like crazy, and uh, they split us up into three platoons. My buddy ended up in second platoon, I was in first platoon. And I looked at him out of the corner of my eye, and it just said the same thing to me. Well, I'm not going to question it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, we went through uh, basic training and, uh, you know, I always looked at boot camp as it was one of the toughest things I, I had done in my life to that point. And uh, I looked at it as a task that had a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, you could see it. Mm -hmm. And when I, when things got really down, I mean, when I, when I got the crap beat out of me by the DI, you know, I just took it and shut up. And, uh, you know, finally that day came when I graduated, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know. So just kind of looking towards the future was a good way to get through it? That was it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so your instructor was pretty abusive, you'd say? No, I don't. And there are reasons for that. For example, one day our platoon was standing outside and it was starting to get towards dusk, and I don't know if you've ever been in uh, South Carolina during uh, flea season, sand fleas, but they swarm like gnats, mm -hmm. and you're standing there at attention, one of them uh, starts to nibble behind your ear, so while you think the drill instructor is looking the other way, you go, Next thing you know, you're dragged into the barracks, stood against the wall, and he hit me in the gut, knocked the wind out of me. Oh. And he, I stood up, he hit me again. And I said, boy, I hope he doesn't hit me a 
third time because I don't know if I can hold it. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And what he said to me was, uh, when you're in combat and you're given an order, you obey it. Mm -hmm. You were at attention. Get out there. That was the cool. So you think he was harsh but fair? Yeah. Preparing you for... Okay. Um, so, uh, how long were you in boot camp? How long was that? Uh, that was three months. Okay. Um, so where did you go after that? Uh, from there I went to uh, Camp Lejeune to the 6th Marine Regiment and uh, we spent a few months there. Uh, that was after, well, after boot camp, of course, we had advanced infantry training and so forth. And okay. That lasted about a month, and uh, then we uh, went to uh, Camp Lejeune, six Marines, and spent a couple of months in Lejeune. And then uh, we sailed, uh, as I said, on that float, which uh, took us down to Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, there we spent uh, six months looking at the Cubans on their side of the lines. And <laughs> yeah. It wasn't the most exciting place in the world, but you know, what are you going to do? You get the good with the bad. So, mm -hmm. um, so what, was your, uh, what were your first impressions when you got to uh, Camp Lejeune? I thought it was a very, very nice base. Uh, all of the barracks were uh, a lot better than I'd seen from some photos of army barracks and so forth. A very, very nice base, I thought. Okay. Um, were you going to say something? No. Okay. Um, what was your assignment there? Uh, I was attached to the weapons platoon and uh, we were uh, training in 106 millimeter recoilless rifles, flamethrowers and uh, 3.5 rocket launchers uh, as an upgrade from uh, 0311 which was the M MOS or uh, military occupational specialty given to uh, infantrymen as gr or grunts mm -hmm. to infantry assault man. I don't know if you'd consider that promotion or not, but you know that that was uh, then you were an O three fifty one. So no more money, just the title. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you got to use those weapons, like flamethrowers, or...? Uh, I did, but not in Vietnam. Yeah. When I went to Vietnam, uh, I, I still maintained the 0351 MOS, but I was just a grunt, and that's, that was fine with me, a, yeah. a stay of grunt. So you had the training for it, but you never used yeah. it in Vietnam. Okay. Right. Um, so then you went, after four months there, you went to Guantanamo Bay? Right, we were in Guantanamo Bay. And we, we were more or less uh, given sections of the uh, lines across from the Cubans and uh, just stayed there, base security. Mm -hmm. That was it. So your assignment is just uh, security? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what were your first impressions of uh, Guantanamo Bay? Oh, it was terrible. It <laughs> was isolated. There was very, very little to do when you were uh, off duty, except uh, maybe go to the beach. That that was about it, mm -hmm. you know. And even going to the beach every day gets a little bit old after a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we were glad to board ship and get the heck out of there. We were, very happy. Yeah. Um, so did you have like a schedule uh, or was it kind of, um, did you know what your schedule was going to be ahead of time? Uh, schedule for 
like, did you know, like, the hours you're going to work every day? Oh, you mean, was it like a, a bank job? No, uh, not at all. Uh, generally, they were uh, day and night shifts. Uh, periodically, they'd have a drill where we'd, uh, you know, jump in our Jeeps with the 106s and you know, run up to the line and, you know, that, but that was about it. There wasn't a lot going on there. Okay. Um, so after Guantanamo Bay, then you, um, where'd you go after that? Uh, I came back to Lejeune and got my uh, orders for Westpac, uh, which is uh, military jargon for Western Pacific. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, from there, uh, I got my orders. I came home for 30 days. They gave you 30 days leave before you went. Uh, and, you know, so, uh, say goodbyes. And then uh, it was off to uh, Vietnam. And uh, you flew a commercial flight to uh, San Francisco. Uh, and then you went to Travis Air Force Base, which is in close proximity to that. I really don't don't know how far it is, but mm -hmm. uh, the from uh, Travis we flew to Alaska, believe it or not, yeah. and refueled, and we were given the opportunity to get off the aircraft, and so a couple of us. Uh, Oh, okay, well, uh, we'll, uh, get off. They hand us these big, big woolen Air Force parkas, <laughs> and I'm going, oh my God, what did I do? It was so cold. We were there about, I think, an hour and a half, and we're flying on, uh, World Airways which was owned by the CIA, as I understand that it was part of Air America. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <laughs> boy, I'll tell you what, and then they flew us to uh, Okinawa. Okay. And Okinawa, I was there the first day. I remember they had Quonset huts with rows and rows of racks, beds, cots, you know, mm -hmm. strung together. And they go, okay, this group over here is from there. And they were mingling the uh, veterans who were coming back with the guys that were going. And the way I knew that was one guy woke woke up screaming, and I'm laying there, and I'm going, oh my God, what did you get yourself into? And uh, when I enlisted, I was offered, I'm just going to backtrack for a second, yeah, sure. uh, I was offered an aviation guarantee because I had scored above a certain point on their intelligence test, I guess. So, mm -hmm. and I looked at my buddy and he looked at me and I said, No, I'm not going to take it, I'll just go in the infantry. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, but with that memory in mind, the way they would inform you of what unit you were going to was they used to gather everybody every two hours. You'd all sit on the ground and they had a platform in the middle and the guy would get up there with a list and read names and serial numbers there. And then he gets up there this is the second or third time I'd been there. I, I can remember I, I'd gone to about two or three of them and uh, nothing. So I'm sitting there 
he gets three Fs. Listen, he goes, Ferguson, Third Marine Air Wing. And I, I perked up and I said, oh boy, the crotch screwed up. <laughs> That's what we used to call, call the Marine Corps, the crotch. <laughs> I was like grinning from ear to ear. And next thing he says is, Ferguson, 3rd Marine Division, and I said, no, they didn't screw up, but somewhere in this huge crowd, there's another Ferguson who's headed over there, <laughs> but he was smart enough to take the aviation guarantee. The way I always looked at it was, like, I got shot over there, I only had to fall six feet. When you're in the air wing on a chopper, yeah, I said, no, no, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> not, not that I'm afraid of them, but I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So so that's kind of, when you got to Okinawa, That's is that the first time you started feeling nervous about going to Vietnam, or were you already? Oh, well, you know, I mean, I, I was nervous, especially after spending a couple of nights in that Quonset hut, listening to these guys moaning and you know, having dreams and so mm -hmm. forth and nightmares. And that's what I think concerned me most was, boy, don't, don't let yourself get into that state of mind over there where it starts to gnaw at you like these guys are going home and they're taking all of this baggage with them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, so after Okinawa then... Okay, then uh, I went to Da Nang and we uh, went through processing and uh, they assigned me to the 4th Marine Regiment, which uh, was in the 3rd Division and well up on the uh, demilitarized zone. And uh, they sent me to a place called Dang Ha first. And then from Dang Ha, we spent three days getting further processed, and then we were taken right to the unit by uh, a convoy of trucks, which uh, the name of the place was called Charlie 2. And what it was was a fire base that had been constructed with the bunkers and everything. Uh, they were were in off an operation and in Charlie two at the time and we spent well, I'd say uh, a couple of uh, yeah, a couple of months there. I remember it was monsoon boy. You wouldn't think that in Vietnam you could be cold, but it used to get down, it felt like it was below freezing because everything was damp and wet and you just couldn't, uh, you know, uh, yeah. but it was, after I got to uh, my unit, they put me with uh, Bravo 1 which was the first squad, uh, first squad, first platoon, mm -hmm. and I was part of India Company, which, uh, you know, I primarily operated with, uh, in company size operations, very seldom a battalion size, but, uh, yeah, generally come these size, and uh, we used to go out on sweeps, search and destroy missions, just look. We didn't have a lot of 
VC in our area. We had a few, but very few. As a matter of fact, uh, my squad captured one one day. We were walking into this village across this uh, open uh, meadow, and there were clumps of bushes sporadically scattered all over. We were walking, and all of a sudden, this guy pops up with his hands like this. Where obviously a VC, uh, he was wearing a VC uniform. Some of them used to wear a type of uniform that you could distinguish them from the uh, NBA in the area and so forth. But it was the guy in front of me, Graham was his name, a big, big, black guy, I mean, he was big. He reached out, grabbed the guy by the front of the shirt, lifted him up. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe it, you know, I'm standing there with my M16 going a slack job like everybody else, you know, we couldn't believe this guy had popped up one. Uh, I think half of the battalion had already just walked by him, but mm -hmm. what we found out was he had fallen asleep and he woke up and there oh. were all of these <laughs> Marines all around him and he wasn't about to fight it out with, uh, you know, a battalion of Marines, so, mm -hmm. but that was comical. Well, he, so he thought you guys found him, but he could have stayed asleep and you would yeah, have Yeah, we probably would have walked, walked right on by him, that would have been it. Wow. Um. Uh, so what was your assignment there? Uh, uh, initially, I had a fire team. Uh, and as I explained earlier, the squad, which was 12 to 13 men, generally had three fire teams of four men each, plus his radio man and a squad leader. And a specific Marine is put in charge of each of these fire teams and knows what he's supposed to do in situations, usually it's the most experienced guy in that particular fire team that's a uh, fire team leader. And, uh, you know, he just, he's been there. He knows what to do because you just got to react. And, uh, you know, we, for example, if you, you walked into an ambush, he knows you assault the ambush. You don't get down and start shooting. You, you charge them, basically. It, it, and if you tell a civilian that, they, they look at you slack jaw, they cannot believe that you. But that's the way we were trained. And it goes back to that in the hallway with the DI punching me twice. Mm -hmm. You know, you just do it. That's the way it is. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so your, your assignment is mainly sweeping the area? Yeah, yeah, just uh, infantry sweeps. Uh, I had a uh, I had a fire team for about three months after I got there. And then I got promoted because of rank more than anything else to corporal. And when my fire team leader rotated back to the States, I moved into his slot. So I, I had a team, uh, a squad and, uh, you know, it was, uh, interested because here was this, <laughs> this city boy who didn't know squat when you think about it I'd been there for three months I'm going, oh my god you know and uh, he, uh, all I could think of was you're gonna be responsible for getting some of these men killed and I was kind of having a tough time with that, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was a 
funny, funny, I just kind of got dropped into it. I mean, I'd been in combat situations before that promotion, if you call it that. Mm -hmm. So I knew what I was doing, but I was hesitant to do it for an entire squad. Mm -hmm. and, but hey, I did it for the rest of my tour and that. You know, it, it worked out all right, you know, but when, when I came back, even after I got out for a long, long time, I'd say years. So we were talking about um, how you kind of felt responsible yeah, for people yeah. in your squad. And that lasted a good five or six years and you know it was uh, basically after I left them Marines unlike uh, other branches of the service think of themselves as brothers I think I felt guilt, like I'd abandoned them. Mm -hmm. So, um, were there any casualties in the unit that you were at? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, I lost four guys while I was over there. And uh, I can remember everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, I could start out. I'll tell you, tell you a story. I was uh, I was a squad leader. Well, we were our company was assigned the task of going in to retrieve the bodies of four recon marines who had been caught flat-footed by the uh, NVA and uh, they assumed all of them had been killed. So we helicoptered in the company and uh, about a click and a half click being 1,000 meters mm -hmm. away from the actual spot where they were last heard from. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, we walked in there. Sure enough, we find the four of them. So we set up a perimeter and uh, we uh, recovered the bodies and put them on a helicopter, they brought them on these old H-34s there. They were not Vietnam era, but they, they were old helicopters mm -hmm. and uh, they hauled the bodies out of there. And uh, <coughs> the captain got orders, he says, to stay in the area, work the area and see if you can find out why these guys were killed because reconnaissance marines receive special training for missions where they go out in four or six man teams for maybe a week or more you know and it was uh, you know, so we decided we'd uh, poke around up, up here and uh, the lieutenant, <laughs> we had a, boy this guy was new, I mean he'd only been with the unit, this was his first operation going into the jungle, this, I mean he was fresh out of OCS, mm -hmm. he, had, he 
he says, he called me Furby for some reason. I don't know where he, where he got it. I know where he got it, but I've mm-hmm. been kind of familiar with him. What's the stupid answer? You know, thinking to myself, but uh, he says, Furby, we need an OP, an observation post, up this trail about 400 meters, 300 meters. I said, okay, sir. So I got two other guys and myself. And I said, I'll go on the OP because I want to see what's up there and make sure we don't walk into something. I was always very cautious of walking into something. I just didn't want to be surprised. So we got up the trail. I'd say about 300 meters. Well, we hear all of this gunfire break out. AK-47s and M-16s. And you can tell the difference in the sound. So I'm thinking, okay, come on guys, come on with me. So we just got off the trail behind this bamboo stand or whatever and the three of us with uh, the uh, M16s I'm going oh crap we're never going to get out of this mess because now the gooks you could tell we didn't know how many there were but we knew that they were between us and the company that we just left I'm going wow that's great so we're sitting there behind this bamboo and we could hear the firing and then all of a sudden nothing. And we hear Vietnamese voices coming down the trail. And there were, as far as I knew, three or four of them sounded like them. So when I got down there, we opened up on them. Well, we killed two, the third one we wounded. He dropped his rifle and a few other things, but and then took off into the uh, jungle. So I said, hold up, we're not going to chase him, because we'll end up in trouble for sure. <laughs> so. We got all of there, checked them for information, intelligence, and all that. And then we took their weapons and their ammo and ran us back up the trail and hooked up with the company. And uh, so, anyway, the company moved uh, up the trail. We found a place to set in for the night. We did that. Next day, we were told that we were going to have a platoon sized patrol into the area, starting with where we'd had it out with these NVA, and uh, then see if we could follow his trail. And I think, well, it's probably not a good idea, but we'll do it, you know. And the lieutenant put my squad on point because we knew where exactly that confrontation had taken place. So, what it was was we entered on a ridge and then it sloped down into a, no, we wouldn't call it a valley, but you know, like kind of like a valley. Mm-hmm. and. Uh, we turned when we got to where we, we had to run it with the gooks. And uh, I shouldn't use that term gooks because that's what we used to call them in sure. Vietnam. But they were very good soldiers. You couldn't take it away from them. Mm-hmm. They were sharp as tacks. And they didn't usually mess with Marines unless they thought they had a pretty good chance of getting the upper hand or doing some serious damage. Mm-hmm. And, uh, thankfully, that didn't happen all that often. But, uh, in any event, we were headed down this ravine when the point man 
this gentleman named Pinnock and Holtz. Okay, found some. Here's uh, the NVA used to wear a bandolier that kind of wrapped around their back and it had room for three magazines in the front. And uh, he finds this magazine with blood. So I called the lieutenant and I told him he was in the second, middle of the second squad somewhere. And he uh, halted the column. He says, go down and see what you can see, Fergie. <laughs> so we started to head back down the bank, just a squad, taking our time really looking things over. We find the pith helmet that DNBA wore as helmets. Something's not right here. It just ate at my gut. I said, something is not right. We're being set up. So I called back to the lieutenant and I said, Lieutenant, I says, we've got a pith helmet. And he goes, oh, good, we'll keep on going. I said, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea, sir. And he said, no, no, well, I talked to the captain. He said, keep on going. I can't believe he did that because the captain was an old hand that had been in uh, Vietnam four or five months and I said he's a company commander you schmuck don't make him look like a jerk so he says uh, now uh, push it see if we, we can find something else so we go down 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 and by now We've got this separation of about, I'd say, 150 yards between the second squad, which where the lieutenant was, and the end of my first squad. We're way down, we're down in this depression or whatever. So we came up on a canteen. That's when I said, well, I'm not going in there. I don't care what he says because he can bust me for all I care. I'd rather be a live uh, fire team leader than a dead squad leader. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I called him and I told him, sir, we got a canteen. There is something that is not right here. And uh, there I am with this canteen. I was saying, what the heck is going on here? So I asked the lieutenant, I said, sir, I, I think we should should turn around and come back on higher ground on, I don't care, the right or left flank because it actually had two ridges and funneled down into this little valley. And he says, oh, no, 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 you got to keep going. That's when I told him. I said, no. That's all I said was, no. And I turned my squad around in place and, and told them to move out. That's when all hell broke loose. But we were not, were not in their kill zone. If we had traveled another 25 meters, then we would have been done deal, you know. I mean, it was an L-shaped ambush. There was no way we were getting out of it. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, <laughs> those were the days. Yeah. Made, made you aware of... <laughs> ah. I guess the fact that you're mortal, mm -hmm. really, really think about it. Well, that
there was a civil war that we never should have gotten involved in to begin with. And, but that hasn't stopped them since. They've been getting involved all over the globe for the last <laughs> 40 years doing the same thing. They live and learn. So you think your, um, your experience in Vietnam kind of painted how you feel about the military now? The military... Or the decisions, you know? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Because when I came back from Vietnam, I mean, <laughs> I, call me crazy, but despite being wounded, having immersion foot, and having falciparin malaria. Now, I'm saying, well, you know, maybe you're using up your luck too fast here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I came back, first place they sent me, oh my God, Boston Navy Yard, the Marine Barracks, I'm going, oh God. I did not want to do that kind of duty where you stood on a gate somewhere waving Navy personnel primarily. You know, no, no, no. But I had no recourse, so I got shipped up there, and which in a way was good because it was uh, two and a half hours from home. I could come home like that on a weekend, and, but but the duty was terrible as far as I was concerned. Uh, so one day, I was walking down the hallway in one of the uh, the administrative buildings that they have there, and I hear, "Hey, Fergie!" Look, it wasn't wasn't the lieutenant that used to, but this is probably where I picked it up, but yeah. it was the first lieutenant or the executive officer from our company. He sees me, oh, I'm so happy to see someone. He's going on and on and on. He asked me, he says, what are you doing here? And I said, sir, if I could answer that, then I could get out of this place. That's what I told him. And he goes, I don't blame you. This place is the pits. He goes, I'm trying to wangle something else myself. He goes, but he says, let me see uh, what I can do about your situation. And I said, yeah, yeah, fine, sir. Nice talking to you. And I didn't even think about it after that because I figured, Oh, he's an officer. What's he care? What were one of his old buddies from Vietnam got stuck? Two weeks later, I got orders for Quantico, Virginia, to the uh, officer candidate school, where we were with school demonstration troops, which was the instructors at. OCS. And so I had basically a nine to four job, five days a week. <laughs> it was like, mm -hmm. was like working in a bank. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was. And I stayed there uh, until the end of uh, my enlistment. Which was um, 69, right? Yep. October 69. Um, so, uh, how long were you in Vietnam? 13 months. Okay. The army sent their troops for a year. Uh, I don't know why the Navy and Marine Corps thought we ought to be over there for 13 months. Probably because of some stupid thing with the army for all I know. I mean, I'm just surmising. I see General said, oh, I won't show you, you know. <laughs> but I, I don't know, but I was there for 13 months. Okay. Um, 
So, how long were you in Boston? Oh, God. Uh, about, I don't even think it was a full two weeks. Oh, okay. Uh, so, you just got there. Man, I, I don't know. The, the guys there hated the place. And I'm going, uh, I don't blame you. Boy. Didn't polish. So it was kind of like Guantanamo Bay, where it was just boring, nothing to do. What What was it? Was it kind of like when you were at Guantanamo Bay? Because there it was just boring, nothing to uh, do. Oh no, because uh, you know you had Boston was right there and okay. so forth. But everything was fine as far as Liberty went, but as far as the base, nah, not not for me. I mean, you take a mud marine. And then you drop them in a place that's all spit and polish. It just doesn't feel right. Like at mm -hmm. the time, it didn't. You know. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Um. And so Quantico, that was you were there for about a year then. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what was your assignment there? I was. Let me see. We used to give classes, as I uh, told you earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, we were trained on the 106, the flamethrower, and the 3.5 rocket launcher. So I went to the uh, platoon, which uh, handled those weapons and uh, we used to put on demonstrations and classes as to uh, how to use them, how not to use them, and yeah. Most of them were uh, fresh out of college and they were very good. I think that Marine officers are the best, they really do, because they, for the most part, more so than other branches of the service, I think, uh, watch out for their Marines. So you, you really think the Marines are like a family, yeah. much more than the other branches? Definitely. Okay. Um, oh, I know what I was going to say, uh, you were asking me about uh, something about my, uh, when, when I got out, I, I don't recall, but I was going to tell you that there were uh, times when I was at Quantico, which was, was great, like nine to four, and we're into D.C. for mm -hmm. a few beers, you know, yeah. that kind of attitude, and, uh, yeah, and uh, I thought, well, if you stay here for a year or a year and a half, was Vietnam that bad? And I said, in a way it was, but in a way it wasn't. Nobody messed with you when you were in Vietnam. If you did your job and your unit knew what they were doing, they pretty much left you alone. And I think that's what a lot of the guys, uh, there were a lot of guys that I knew who extended for six months and they'd send them home for 30 days and then they come back for the additional six. And, uh, I almost did that, but I said, well, you know, I, it was kind of funny because I, when I first got to Vietnam, I was, uh, you know, I was a Lance Corporal, but I was still green as grass as far as this general warfare thing was. And, uh, I can remember the first patrol that I went on. And I creeped along the jungle. All of 
of a sudden we're told to stop. So we stopped. We're squatting down in the jungle and looking out to the left and to the right and this and the other thing. And after a couple of minutes, I guess, the guy in front of me, what's see something he goes says to me he goes no he smells something and I said to myself he smelled something I said I don't get it so he asked me I said what do you mean he smelled something he goes you, you can't smell that and I couldn't you know what they were smelling? The gooks, the NBA. They'd been in the area. They had their uh, bunkers and so forth all over the place. But they used a lot of garlic in their food and so forth. And he could smell them before he saw anything. And then I I was saying, oh my God, you're a dead man. You're never going to get out of this place alive. And by, I'd say, the time I was there, maybe four or five months, I could smell. It was as if your senses your hearing, your sense of smell, your sense of taste were all heightened. I don't know why. Maybe uh, you just get a little bit of adrenaline or something. Mm -hmm. But that was, that's what scared me. That's why I said no, I think you better get out of here because at the end of my tour, I kind of felt like I was going to miss it in a way. And now I could see those ideas were, you know, foolish. But I didn't didn't uh, think Vietnam was that bad. You know, I mean, it was bad, but maybe it's just a matter of having uh, the ability to uh, turn it on and turn it off, just like a switch mm -hmm. that you have, and maybe that's it. Who knows? <laughs> um. So you can talk about um, your awarded medals, citations? Was I awarded medals or citations? Mm -hmm. No, I received the Purple Heart Medal for being wounded, but uh, I was put in by a, uh, put in for a Silver Star. Mm -hmm. And I could never figure out why. Because the day uh, after that ambush occurred, we were back up on the line. Uh, figured it was a regiment or division working in the hills around there. The lieutenant comes up to me and he says, Bertie. <laughs> So I can still hear his name there, you know, he shivers the way he said it or something <laughs> But he, I, uh, <laughs> oh, God, he says, what do you think of this? And hands me a notepad, you know, one of like butt size of a stenographer's his notebook. And I said, no, oh, I, I look at it. It was a first, a first for me, I mean, Having anybody hand me something to read is rare, but from an officer to me, I, what he did was he wrote up a citation for the Silver Star for me 
because of what happened in the ambush. And I said, I said to him, I said, sir, I don't deserve this. I said, I didn't do anything that any Marine would have done. No. Boy, he's a pip. <laughs> and I think he still turned the damn thing in, whatever became of it, I have no idea. Okay. But most of us didn't care about medals. We cared about getting out of there. Yeah. 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 Which is not a bad thing to be uh, waiting for. Boy, I'll tell you, we used, used to have that calendar written on the side of our helmets with the check marks each month. So do you think it was kind of like when you're in boot camp, just kind of looking at the light at the end of the tunnel um, to help you get through it? I think maybe that's my mentality. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I kind of look at, hey, what happens, happens. There came a point in Vietnam where I think... When you get there, you're scared to death. Yeah, treading very cautiously, you know. And we didn't have to deal with a lot of booby traps. Those were primarily down south around Da Nang. The first division had to worry about them. We just had to worry about NVA, which, uh, like I said, they wouldn't generally uh, mess around with you unless they thought they could really do some serious damage, but mm -hmm. <laughs> we, uh, I'll tell you, I think about Vietnam sometimes, just be out on a walk, I'll think about it, I think that's, you know, a, Something I'll see will trigger a memory. Yeah. So you still think about your time there a lot? Yeah, I do. Uh, not a lot, I don't think. But every now and then. Every now and then, you know, it's like uh, we have a couple of uh, decks in our house, and one of my great pastimes during the nicer weather is I have my chaise out there. In the evening I'll just come out there and sit there and just watch the cars go by and so forth and you know that that's when it'll come to me. At night. glad that uh, you uh, had the opportunity to ask me these questions, but uh, it's been a long time. Yeah. Um, so uh, when you're in the service, uh, did you stay in touch with your family? <laughs> my, my mom and dad wrote to me about twice a week. I used to write to them when I was stateside or in Guantanamo. I wrote to them about, yeah, maybe once every couple of weeks I jot a few lines down in the mail. When I got to Vietnam, I started out writing about every couple of weeks. By the middle of my tour, wasn't writing at all. There was kind of like, uh, you know, I think about it and I said, maybe we're just too damn tired. 
And, you know, where, where we were was the Enemies Cordillera, which is the mountain range in uh, Vietnam and Laos, Cambodia, yeah. all that stuff. And uh, we were operating in that area for a whole year. We had no breaks, with the exception of a one-week R&R. &R. Yeah, you know, I don't know how they figured we could hold up. I guess because we were we were Marines, you know. And I'm saying that's fine, but when you load someone's back with on average, I would say, a 60-pound pack, give them a rifle, and all of the various equipment that hangs off of you. I said, and then you walk them up and down these mountains for maybe 11 or 12 hours. Then you get to a place where you can settle in with the company of platoon and uh, you have them dig foxholes <laughs> and and then the next day you get up pack up your gear do it all again leave it all behind you know uh, this country gets involved in those damn civil wars. That's what scares me. Yeah. So do you kind of, um, you feel like the people that are uh, in the service today doing, they're kind of doing what you did? Do, do I feel? Do you feel that you can kind of relate to the people who are um, involved in those conflicts oh, now? Oh, definitely, yeah. Well, I mean all services. Uh, I have a son-in-law who is a chief petty officer in the Coast Guard and he's been in for eight or nine years and uh, he's up in Maine now and uh, you know, yeah we've talked about it and I said to him, I said, hey, as far as I'm concerned, someone who uh, has been in the military and is a veteran deserves our thanks. Mm -hmm. They really do. Yeah. Because nothing's standing between us and uh, God knows what if, if it wasn't for our military. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah. Um, so you talked about uh, you were wounded. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we were side of Quezon and we were told we were going to assault 689 which was the elevation of the hill next next to it. Well, okay. Well, it's, it was late afternoon when the jets got there, they didn't get there on time, and uh, they were supposed to have uh, done a job on this hill, but from what I understand, uh, they only got to drop half of what they were going to uh, do, primarily to time constraints with the daylight fading and everything else. Mm -hmm. So. We took off up the hill, got in line, just like the old Minutemen, <laughs> and we went up that hill. And when we got to the top, it was 
the hammer. And he, oh my God, you know, I just couldn't believe it. everything was gone. It must have pounded the heck out of this. And we're coming up, coming up, coming up. And my my fire team was on my uh, left hand side. Carl Dagger, the other fire team leader, and my best friend uh, over there was uh, on my right. And uh, the, just as we got to the top, gooks popped up in spider holes, three, three of them, and just started to fire on us. So we're in assault mode, so we're, we're bearing down on them, and they're firing like crazy. All of a sudden, this goo pops up with his AK. I thought he was going to shoot, but he didn't. He throws a grenade, and these Chicon grenades, which were about that long, were the real crudely made, but they did the job, you know, they were uh, homemade, most of them with cast heads and stuff. And, uh, I see this grenade coming and over and towards me, and I fell away from it. Laying on my stomach, I had time to look back and see it laying about three feet from my leg. So it goes off. And luckily, Chicom grenades, uh, not the Russian ones, but the homemade ones, were less deadly than goes off and it just felt like someone had come up to me and kicked me in the foot. Mm -hmm. I went, wow. I said, I didn't feel any sharp pain or anything. And I said, thinking that's good. So I'm laying on my stomach and I turned around like this to start to get up when the goop pops up again with the AK. Pep, 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 pep. I watched the rounds hit the dirt on this barren landscape, bounce, and I kind of went like this because I feel well, you're, you're, the next round's not going to bounce. It's hit me in the hip, grazed me, mm -hmm. two of them, and I, what it felt like to me anyway, when I got shot, it wasn't really a gunshot, a grazing wound. Uh, it felt like uh, someone had taken a blowtorch. It hit me in the hip with it. I'm going, wow, you know. But next thing I know, Carl Dagger was laying down beside me. He'd come in and laying there. Rounds came by again. He got hit in the spine and was killed instantly, which I was grateful for. You know, I didn't want to God, don't let him linger. You know? yeah. and, uh, that, uh, He had uh, just gotten married before he came to Vietnam. Jeez, he was a good looking guy. Good looking wife. She was pregnant with their first child when he left for Vietnam. He went
went to, uh, I had to remember, he was going to Hawaii, which was one of the R&R &R destinations, but they uh, used to uh, kind of try to save Hawaii for the married guys. Mm -hmm. and I don't blame them. I said, heck, if I want to go to Hawaii, I'll go someday. I'm not going to screw someone here who's trying to meet with their wife and, you know, yeah. But it, well, he, he met her in Hawaii and uh, came back half days of clam. You know, he hadn't seen his kid yet, but the kid was about to be born about a month later. And it was a boy. And uh, so, after you were uh, injured, did you? Um, what happened after that? They send you home. Well. Joe Gallo, one of the other squad leaders, came over, grabbed me, and walked me off the hill. I got on a, on a medevac chopper, and they took us to uh, the medical facilities at Kaysan, which were you know, we, this was for the real serious guys. I mean, they had a full operating table, everything else there, and uh, they, uh, so we got on another chopper, and he took us to Charlie Med. Was uh, Chulai, but uh, they checked us out and they had us all sitting in chairs along the uh, wall, and we were all ambulatory, you know. What I mean, we were, we were sitting there. She comes over to me and she says, uh, what, "What's your problem?" You know. <coughs> I mean, kind of a nice way, you know, mm -hmm. what's your problem? Mm -hmm. And so I told her, I said, well, I said, I got grazed a couple of times on the hip, and she looked at me, she went, oh, that's no big deal. She goes, we'll take care of that. And she says, anything else? And I said, well, well I had a grenade go off, and uh, felt like uh, hit me, something hit me in the foot. She goes, let's take a look. So she cuts my jungle boot off. I look, here's a bloody sock. It's got a hole in it that big, and it's right where, uh, I don't even know what they call it, that uh, small bone on the side of yeah. your foot. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not there on one of my feet. No, it's uh -huh. gone. But I have a piece of shrapnel go right in, just like that. He's about that long and that wide. So we, uh, I get wheeled into the operating room. <laughs> and uh, go in, but they put me on the table. There's two Navy doctors standing there and getting ready to, you know, they're going through us like. Like nothing, you know. I guess we were, must have been one of the uh, less lesser injured. Uh, <laughs> I look at the wall. Boy, it's got. They've got a sign that says in big red letters on a white background. Pain builds character. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and the doctor looks at me and goes, 
don't worry, don't worry, we're not going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> and they took it out, and that was, that was, I went to Cameron Bay to the 6th Army Convalescent Hospital in uh, Cameron Bay uh, for a month, and then I came back to my unit. Okay. Um, did you always have enough supplies while you were over there? Uh, yeah, pretty much, uh, yeah, and we'd get beer and coke every so often, uh, and sea rations were no problem. We, mm -hmm. we had, only time we were without supplies was they had, uh, terrible, terrible typhoon hit the country in the fall of, uh, I think it was October uh, of 1968, and uh, we did not eat for four days. The reason was that helicopters couldn't even even flying that that mess, you know. Mm -hmm. But if we were sending guys back to our old campsites. What we used to do was we used to punch holes in the cans of sea rats that we didn't want, throw them in the hole and bury them. We were sending people back to get get the cans that we'd punctured and buried. Oh my God. I don't know if I'm that hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Is there anything you did for good luck? For good luck? Yeah, anything special. Uh, yeah, carried that green thing. <laughs> uh, okay. yeah. The uh, dollar bill you split between three people. Yeah, yeah. So you always had that with you? Yeah, I've always had it. In, uh, I wish I could recover the others, but one guy is dead and one guy is, uh, I don't know, he moved to some place or other. Mm -hmm. um, so, how did people entertain themselves? Hmm? How, did you do anything for entertainment? <laughs> well, while I was in the hospital, After about three weeks, they were having a, a uh, I don't know, you call it USO show or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, it was Bob Hope and Aunt Margaret, Jerry Colonna, and a bunch of these older stars who uh, donated their time, and uh, we were going to go to it. But I was limping, and you know my my friends in the uh, ward where I was were all kind of gimpy. So <laughs> the nurses, come on, get in the truck. So we get in the back of this truck. She drives down to the stage and says to him, "I've got a bunch of." Uh, wounded marines and soldiers here who need a hand getting to their seats. Can you find them some down front? They must have had a platoon of guys come out to the truck, coming in, they're lifting us, and I'm going, when they're lifting us, I can walk. <laughs> Took us down to these seats, and, uh, they were, uh, it was funny because during the show, they were kind of like staff. They were around various places. <laughs> this one, they brought Aunt Margaret out, and everyone in our group stood up by themselves. Yeah! And I'm looking at the guy. That's my. What are they doing, standing? <laughs> So you saw a USO show yeah. while you were there. Yeah. Anything else for yeah. okay. no, We were in the bush. There were 
Well, you see, the month I was wounded, there was I was out of the bush. Uh, the uh, two weeks for R and R, a couple of days to get in and a couple of days to get out. That's uh, that was about it. The rest of the time we were out there in the boondocks. Once in a while we'd come into a combat base and uh, replenish or get uh, new uh, replacements or whatever. But it, it, one thing I noticed about Vietnam There wasn't a uh, new guy mentality like in the Marine Corps is there was in the Army from what I hear. Mm -hmm. In the Army, guys told me that the new guy, you didn't get a bomb flu. Because he, he, he might get killed. You don't want to be his friend. And this mm -hmm. that and the other thing. And in the Marine Corps, we got new guys in it, but you kind of assigned them someone and said, hey, he's your guy, you teach him. Mm -hmm. You teach them. You don't just throw them to the wolves. I mean, that's goes back to your first question. That's what I was talking about. Marines are Marines. So they're really like a family. Yeah. Um. So, uh, did you keep a journal? No, wish I had. Mm -hmm. Because I've always had the uh, inclination, I'll say, but now that I'm older, um, I've kind of gone away from that, was to uh, write a book about Vietnam. Yeah. Or write a novel about Vietnam. I always toyed with the idea. I always loved writing, and uh, I'm an avid reader, uh, but never followed through on it. Um, so, you were in Quantico when your service ended, right? Yeah. Um, do you remember your last day, in particular? <laughs> yeah, I do. Oh my God! I remember getting up in the morning. Well. I'll tell you a little story first. The week prior to my discharge, my lieutenant, who was a Mustang, and by a Mustang, I mean an officer who was promoted from the enlisted ranks, such as uh, staff and CEO or something like that, called me into his office. Asked me, he said, Have you thought about staying in? And I said, Yes, sir, I have. I said, But unfortunately, my family needs me right now. Uh, my dad is very sick. And uh, gotta get out. So he said, Well, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, if your situation ever changes, gave me his business card, he said, give me a call. Well, you know, I told him, I said, well, if I could come back with some rank, maybe in uh, six months or a year, if this is resolved, then I'll, uh, he goes, he goes, give me a call. And then uh, the uh, last day, we got up in the morning, 
had our sea bags packed and everything else. And, um, came downstairs. I was on the third floor where the administrative functions were all located. And uh, beautiful barracks. The barracks that we had there were exceptional. They were more like uh, Ivy League dorms, you know. They were they were really very uh, comfortable, and <laughs> so. Uh, but I came downstairs, looked at this desk, which was about maybe the width of this room, jam packed with Marines who were getting out. I thought, oh my God. So it took me about an hour to stand in that crowd and finally get a surgeon who could uh, process me. <laughs> yeah. And that was that. My uh, dad passed away in uh, April 1970, about five, six months after I got out. Yeah, my mom and my uh, two sisters, who were uh, the young ones in the family, uh, and I said, well, I better stick around for a while, uh, just to be on the safe side. So I gave up being in the Marine Corps. Um. So, uh, did you go to work somewhere for that? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I started out going to college on the GI Bill. Yeah. And, uh, got my, uh, surveying or topography uh, certificate from, uh, the, uh, Hartford State Technical College had a two-year uh, program that taught surveying. And then I went to work for Northeast Utilities and worked there in various positions until I was uh, there 31 years and then uh, got out when I was 55. Came home one day and said to Joy, I said, Hey, the house is paid for, the cars are paid for, we have no bills. I'm out of there before they kill me because <laughs> they were loading us up with work. It was, oh God, it's terrible. Yeah. So I got out, got myself a little part-time job just to keep my um, hand in, you know, and it worked out okay. Okay. Um. So, have you uh, continued any of the friendships you made in the service? Have I kept them? No. No? no. no. Okay. Um, did you join any veterans organizations? Well, when I got out of the service, went down to the VFW with a friend of my father's. I went there. I sit at the bar with all the guys drinking. They're all sharing stories about uh, various wars or conflicts they were in and so forth. And uh, they uh, sitting there looking at them. Walked out and never walked back. In. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, did you ever attend any reunions or? No. no. Uh, I looked a couple of times. I used to get Leatherneck magazine and uh, 
took a look from my unit a couple of times, but I never saw it in there. So. Okay. I'm sure they've had one or two or three. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you talked about the spit, but overall, uh, how did you think, how did your uh, military experience influence your thinking about war or the military? Well, war is something that uh, we're always going to be fighting for one reason or another, whether it's justified or unjustified. That's for uh, smarter people uh, than me to figure out. But, uh, but my estimation of the military is extremely high. And I'm glad we got them because we'd be uh, in a world of hurt if we weren't. If we, we had had a military, I hate to think where we'd be. Yeah. So you think your time uh, in the Marines really strengthened your opinion of the military? Yeah, I think it did. And you know, the funny thing is, I'm proud I went to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not ashamed of my service here at all. Some people I know are. But I ask them, I say, why? What? I think it was such a terrible experience for them. And again, I'm talking about some of the Army veterans that I've met have, they don't even want to think about it. I said, wow, well, it's too bad because if you think about it, and we're out there with a voice, and uh, you can keep a lot of this stuff from happening again. So do you think it's um, important for veterans to talk about their service to yeah. uh, educate people? Yeah, I do. I had a guy say to me, and he was a former Marine, but he was kind of a jerk, I thought. That's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, you run into good and bad people and sure. hey, all your life. But, yeah. but I remember him making the comment, good Marines, don't talk about what they did in the service. I told him, I said, well, that I disagree with. I said, primarily because I think you have to talk about it. Or Swallow it, keep it inside, and not let it out like I just did to you. But it's, uh, you know, I haven't talked about Vietnam in years and years and years. So, you know, but, uh, yeah. Uh, um, so, overall, how did your uh, service and experiences affect your life, do you think? Oh, I think they affected me in the, the right way. I mean, being a Marine, and I, I'm not saying everyone has to join the Marine Corps. All I'm saying is, for me, being in the Marine Corps showed me or instilled in me a inner toughness for when it came to doing the everyday things in life. made it worthwhile. I, I mean, I, I, when I try and do something, I always go 100%. I drive my wife nuts. But 
You know, I told her, I said, well, what's the point? If you're not going to do it to the best of your ability, I said, that, that's what I learned in the Marine Corps, I think. Don't give up. There's uh, always a solution or a remedy, you know. It's, yeah. Okay. Um, is there anything else you want to add that we didn't discuss? No, nah, I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> I just want to sit here and I'll tell you war stories. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any more stories you want to? Uh, oh, a dozen of them. A dozen of them. One day we were just going, uh, we were on a, uh, a hill and uh, we were uh, uh, two, two hills actually. There was the hill, then there was a saddle, and then a higher hill, which was much smaller over here. But the thing was, they couldn't defend the saddles, so what they did was uh, when the Marines took the hill, they did the top of the tall hill and uh, the lower hill. So, we're on the lower hill. In the morning came, uh, we were uh, <laughs> asked to patrol the barbed wire, and uh, we walked out, got outside the wire, all right, we're walking along, and we're checking the wire, make sure the gooks hadn't been, and there were wire cutters the night before, and so forth, and uh, <laughs> There were a couple of dead gooks that we had caught in the wire a couple of nights before who were in the sun, blowing up nicely. I mean, oh my God, they were. I'm walking by and we're going, oh my God, don't let those things burst while we're in there. One of the little guys in the patrol takes his bayonet out and goes, punctured one of them. Oh my God, the stench would have brought you right to your knees. But we kept going. We get down to the bottom portion of the uh, perimeter on a small hill, and we're just coming up to where the saddle was. We got up there, and uh, the uh, point man tells me to hold it before we got to the trail connecting the two, two hills. And, well, okay. Mm -hmm. I came up there, I'm looking, he points just inside the grass, which was this high, all down through that saddle. He says, uh, look, I look, I see a Bangalore torque which the gooks used to make out of a split piece of bamboo about that big around and then they'd wire TNT blocks between them. <laughs> so, I so, I crawled right up to the thing. Still on the other side of the pretty I grabbed the end of it. I pulled it. Pulled back. So when it backed off, we started to blow everything away in that grass. And one of my guys, a new guy, been been with the outfit two days, black guy, Kimbrough. Stood up, we got hit in the chest, finished business. Just like that, two days. But, you know, anybody with a brain in their head knows you gotta get down when you're shooting, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't. Good Lord. He was a cowboy anyway. I got that impression from a couple of days he was there. He couldn't wait to get into it with the gooks. And I said, well, when you get into it with them, let's see if you say that. 
So do you think um, there are a lot of people like that who kind of just wanted to get into the fights, the combat right away? Yeah, there were a few. I mean, you know, I wasn't afraid of combat, but I don't think I was rip roaring to get the thing yeah. going. You know, I figured I'd see plenty of it by the time I uh, got out of there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a few. There were a couple in my outfit who were pretty good, actually. I mean, good jungle fighters. Oh man, they they came back. Two two that came back for that six month extension. <laughs> Hope they made it out. Um, any other stories you wanna? Yeah, not really. No. Kind of stored out. What the heck did I do with my, uh, oh, my cell phone? Uh, must be over there. Um, well, I'd like to thank you for your service oh. and uh, also for taking the time to be interviewed today.